very much for tuning in. This is Nelly McMaster. She's a, a Canadian violinist. She's married to Donal Leahy of the Leahy's. And there's a new album coming out called Canvas. Do you call yourself a fiddler or do you call yourself a violinist? It depends. For the most part, a fiddler. But I remember my grandmother always called it a violin. And so... I mean, some, yeah, sometimes I'll say a violin. I play a violin, you know. Um, yeah. And interesting. Cool. It, even my, my mother-in-law was here yesterday, and she was calling it the violin, the violin, you know. So <laughs> I, I don't know where that comes from with the, with the older generation. You think it'd be the opposite. But I read a great article by Itzhak Perlman a few years back. It was in String Magazine, maybe. And he was saying, you're not a real player until you can call yourself a fiddler. So that was pretty cute. We want to ask you, can you tell us, um, let's go back to the beginning when uh, you were born in Troy, Inverness County, Nova Scotia, and uh, go from there and let us know how you got to play with Faith Hill, we, Carlos Santana as well. So let's start from the beginning. Okay, you were born. Okay, go from there. <laughs> yep. yep, I was born in Troy, Nova Scotia. That's correct. Uh, 1972. I had two older brothers, David and Kevin, my mom and dad, and we lived very peacefully uh, on a one acre property. Uh, I went to school, took fiddle lessons when I was starting fiddle lessons when I was 10. Um, prior to that, I step danced. My mom taught me to step dance. My dad taught me my first few tunes on the fiddle before I took lessons at age nine. And uh, yeah, I had a good life. I Highland danced. I was a Highland dancer. And then uh, when I started taking lessons, I just progressed pretty easily like I always found the fiddle came pretty easily I think it's because it was uh, so much in my community and my family tree my lineage my uncle Buddy McMaster of course being probably one of the most well-known uh, Cape Breton fiddlers certainly he you know played at every house gathering uh, family gathering weddings funerals baptisms, all those different events, you know, where you all gather. And so he, I got to hear him a lot. And I think all those influences and certainly the musicality my mom and dad brought me to uh, being able to play fairly easily. It kind of went in up through osmosis, I think. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, I guess uh, it was a certain time when you chose the violin. Was that your instrument of choice? Yeah, it wasn't even, it wasn't like I set out to choose an instrument. The fiddle was given to me when I was, as I said, nine, nine and a half. And I just, actually what happened was my, my uncle, Buddy McMaster, my, my grand uncle, Charlie McMaster, who lived in Boston, who would be my dad's uncle, uh, sent by mail a fiddle three-quarter size fiddle for any of the McMaster children who would want to play it and my uncle buddy received it and he called dad and he said is there anyone down there at your house interested in this fiddle and I said yeah I'll have a look at it and so we went to buddy's place picked it up and that's what's that's what got me going that's amazing um we're familiar with violins and care and taking care of the violin. Um, like the accessories, like with an, when you buy a violin, what accessories does it come with? Or do you have to buy each in the individual um, accessory with including the, the shoulder rest as well? Yeah, you'll have to buy, I mean, it'll come with a, with a chin rest and, but the shoulder rest, yeah, some some of them come with a shoulder rest, I suppose, but it's very personal. There's a hundred different types of shoulder rests and depending on, you know, the length of your neck and the shape, the contours of your body, like everyone's different. So you can try different ones out. And of course, it'll come with a bow and the bow um, will usually be not that great when you buy a fiddle. Uh, if you buy like the case, the fiddle and the bow, you can pretty much guarantee the bow is not very good. But bows are their own world. Bows are their own world. You, um, I think my husband, Danelle, is more interested in the world of bows than he is in the world of fiddles. He's so <laughs> into it. 
they can change your sound and they also depending on the quality of them they really influence how you play so very important yeah i noticed that you and lindsey sterling and hillary Hunt, they all work their violins very powerfully like you're very talented um i guess you use the rosin as well to clean your violin as well well, the rosin is something you put on the bow. It doesn't mm -hmm. clean the violin. It actually makes it dirty because when it falls off of the bow, it lands on the fiddle and you get a white powder on your instrument, um, which I used to think was a sign of how much you played, right? I had a, an uncle who had just a massive, thick mount of caked rosin on his fiddle. <laughs> and I, wow, he plays so much. Look at the, look at his stripes, you know? And so I always would let, like anytime my dad wanted to clean my fiddle, I'd be like, don't touch it. Don't take that rosin off. I played a lot of hours to get it to build up like that. Anyway, I remember when I was a little older and traveling places, I realized this is not a good sign. This is a sign of neglect, not one to be proud of. So I've since tried to be cleaning off my instrument. In fact, when I met Yo-Yo Ma, I would have had a pile of it on there because he gave me his fiddle cleaner. Wow. He said, here, take this. You need this more than I do. <laughs> That's when they say when you play pool, you have to um, chalk up the cue, like really chalk it up so it really grabs the the uh, cue it, balls as well. So you have to take care of your instrument. Yeah. 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 That that grip, you know, that's that's what the rosin gives. gives the, now, Nellie, when you perform on stage and you're working that violin with the bow and everything, do you ever get the, I, I've seen someone play the violin and all their strings are apart and all over the place and yeah. shaking. Do you ever get that issue as well? Oh, I do. I do. Yeah. Especially there comes a certain point when you're playing. So say you get a fresh bow rehair done. Um, there comes a certain point where you're just like, they just start breaking more easily. Like you break a few and then once, once, you know, say 10 go, then they start, then they all start going. So you get to that point. I've, I've had that point where you're just playing show after show after show and you don't have any time to get to a, a place on tour to find a place and get there to have your bow rehair. Cause it takes a long time to rehair a bow. There's, you're supposed to leave it with them for 24 hours. And um, so, yeah, when you're traveling, you don't necessarily have that luxury, especially if you have a show every night. So I can remember times when I would just like, it would just be at that point where it's just shredding and I'd be on stage and I'm sure by the end of a performance, there'd be like 50 hairs hanging off both ends. <laughs> and sure, it looks cool to the crowd, but it ain't cool for your tone. Let me tell you, it's bad for your tone because you're getting close to the stick. Mm hmm just it, it makes you sound really bad then how do you explain the videos i've seen of violinists who use like the big pen to play the violin what's a big pen you know the pens that came out in the 70s or 80s they had from the company called bic so it's like they they use a pen and they play the violin with the pen by put, stroking it against the strings and it made quite a good sound um but yeah, you have you a have certain sound you like that's the thing right What's that? That's the, but there's a certain sound you like. Yeah. I'm not going to play with a big pen. <laughs> <laughs> but I put some things across there. Like um, like if you flip the bow over and you go actually on the other side of the bow where it's just all wood, it's that same sort of thing as a pen. You play and it, it gives that same kind of sound, which is terrible. But if you're looking for a certain kind of unique thing on a recording or something i can see where you might want to try that yeah is it easy to uh reload if you need new strings do you do them yourself or do you take the violin to get put back together oh yeah just take them to, to just do them yourself yeah so you would know like the strings g d a and f sorry g d a and e you would know those strings up by heart huh? that's a that's, That's amazing. You're talking basic stuff. I think I think all my kids can restring a fiddle. It's not a problem. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so when you started fiddling, how did you get to tour with the Chieftains and Faith Hill? How did that come about? Just uh, being in the industry and, and I guess, you know, making a name for yourself. People, um, well, first of all, the Chieftains, I forget my first call. I can't remember my first um, introduction to them. I can't recall it, but I will say over the years, I mean, Patty would just phone and, or one of his, um, his uh, agent in Canada sometimes would phone my agent in Canada, say, Hey, the chieftains wow. are doing a tour. Uh, is Natalie available for, you know, the three months, you know, oftentimes they toured February, March, April in the States. <clears throat> and over the years, I just did a ton of touring with them and, you know, still to this day, I'll meet people that say, I first heard you with the Chieftains because they used to do such beautiful venues and they stayed in the nicest hotels. And it was like a really awesome gig. And they always gave me a feature spot. So, I yeah. Bet. I, yeah. Was it ever a time when you were playing that you just wanted to give up right there because just too much for your arm going back and forth like that? No, but there have been times off stage where I'm just like, I can remember times when I was just like, all this work is not paying off for me. I'm done, you know. Um, I can remember calling my mom after a show where I just, yeah, just felt like I wasn't where I wanted to be. And I was very down. And I said, Mom, I'm, I'm quit. I'm quitting. <laughs> Lasted for an hour. <laughs> So do these venues, when they ask you to play for them, if you can't or you're unavailable, do they have like a list of other violinists like Joshua Bell or Nicola Benedetti or Sarah Chang? Or do they just call? Do you know anybody else who can do this? Or do they just say, OK, um, how, how does that work for you? How do you get chosen to be part of the venue? Really, I think it's mostly to do with their um, agenda for planning the the um like their concert series like they'll have maybe in the fall i forget the words not coming to my head but anyway when they'll have a committee of people who plan who they're bringing into the theater and oftentimes i think they'll have an agenda for that like okay we want a celtic act see with joshua bell we would not be on the same parallel because he is classical and I'm Celtic. So if they're looking for another Celtic artist, they wouldn't call Joshua Bell. If they want another Celt Celtic fiddler, they might call Ashley McIsaac. Similarly too, if Joshua Bell is unable to do his thing, they're not calling me. I'm the last thing they want. If they're looking for Joshua Bell, they, they're not going to get a stitch of that with me, right? I, I don't even play the same genre music. Like it's, it's the opposite direction. So, um, and yeah, through the agents, that's how the shows get booked, right? There's a system there. And I think that there's, they try and put in a healthy amount of all sorts of different genres. And probably, you know, they want to have a certain amount of female artists and indigenous artists. And there's all those different agendas. So yeah, luckily in the Celtic world um, or folk, um, can we call it fall under the folk category too luckily um there's been tons of work over the years yeah ashley mcisaac i see is i think he's related to you right yep distantly yep yeah yeah um i remember him playing that um that song with i i forget what her name was but uh it was one of these really catchy tunes back the one in the one 80s or something and then suddenly i think ashley disappeared at one point um but yeah, and uh, but Alison Krauss, wow, worked with her. She's our favorite artist as well. Yo Yo Ma, of course. And um, yeah, how'd you meet uh, Leahy? Oh, Danelle. Danelle yeah. Leahy. So Danelle, actually, I was going to college. It was 1991, and I got a phone call out of the blue one day, and there was a gentleman saying, "Hello, my name is Danelle Leahy. You probably don't know me, but I'm a fiddler from Ontario." And I said, I do know you. I have your cassette tape at home. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm in town tonight. And I was wondering if I could take you out to dinner. And that's how 
That's how we met. It was a blind date. He didn't know what I looked like and I didn't know what he looked like. And turns out he drove 20 hours from Ontario and sought me out, uh, asked around. And of course, I was Natalie McMaster and wow. going to Cape Breton, knew everybody would know me and tell him where I was. So that's how he got me. <laughs> we dated for two years and then we broke up for 10 years and then we got married. Wow. Yeah. Well, then it's still hope for me and Kim then. <laughs> no, I don't know. Everybody's got a journey. <laughs> it works for you. <laughs> yep. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah, it's awesome. And you've had seven kids. That's awesome. And many of them are actually um, violinists as well. I think your youngest daughter plays violin. I think she's 13 or something. Well, my youngest um, is four. My oldest four. is 17. And they all play fiddle. Yeah, wow. That's, a, that's, that's incredible. Um, and you're distantly related to Jack White. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. So, mm -hmm. and do you and Donnell have a perfect pitch when you play together or any of I you ever have, off? I don't have perfect pitch, um, but I have relative pitch. So am I ever off? Yeah, but not, not very much. You know, you, when you get to this level, you've played the instrument so many hours that your your fingers automatically go in the right place. You still need to listen big time. I mean, I, I listen intently to my pitch all the time. Yeah. Um, if world-renowned violinist uh, Janine Jensen wanted to do a uh, violin duet with you, I mean... Do you know how to play others like um, maybe Mozart or, or Chopin, or is it just strictly Celtic? I don't know any classical. Really? Okay. Yeah. But you're good. Jingle. You're actually. You really. Pardon? You're. Sorry. Yeah, I think there's the delay, and uh, yeah. you know, maybe I should put like a two second delay there before I speak. <laughs> okay. Um. Yep, and. Um, so tell us about, uh, so you started playing when you were nine and you made your debut with a square dance, Glencoe Mills. Now, I guess that means that you can dance and fill at the same time because, because um, Lindsay Sterling, like, what do you think of her playing? What do you think of all her stuff that she does with the explosions and everything and the way she's dressed and her electronic violin? What do you think of that? What do you think of her Fun. performance? Fun, yeah. great, and good. Yeah. She does a great job. She's, she's carved out a little unique niche for herself, and that's always nice to see. It's very personal, you know, her own personal look and sound and presentation and everything. Um, I did – you mentioned that, too, about dancing and fiddling. Yeah, I started dancing when I was five, so I, I did that as well, step dancing, though. I did not her style of dance. I – was a step dancer. So there came a point where I would combine the two step dancing and fiddling at the same time. And people often still say now that, Oh, you dance while you play. And I real and I'm, and I haven't right. Like I, I'm not dancing while I'm playing, but I realized they're referring to just my body movements. So to me, dancing is like starting actual steps with my feet, uh -huh. step dancing steps. So that's what I consider dancing and fiddling at the same time. Mm -hmm. But I guess if you don't, if you, Put that aside, I think the average public would think that, yeah, oh, she's moving the whole time, which I do. I move the whole time I play, so they, I guess they think I'm just dancing while I'm fiddling the whole time. So, yeah, well, not I, like Lindsay. Yeah, that's incredible. I've seen um, like fiddling virtuosos are like one or two years old, it's incredible, and. I've seen a uh, really professional pianist who was like three or four, and then you started the violin at your age. So there is really no age that you can start a violin. It's like, oh, you're too young. How old are you, 10? Oh, you can't play the violin until you're 13. So it's basically um, if someone came up to you and said, I want to take up the violin, or, or they say my son or my daughter is like four or five, they want to play the violin. What is the one piece of advice you would give them? Well, first of all, there's there's no age barrier. I mean, there's people, we had a fiddle club going on down here and uh, there was people that were in their 60s and they had just started a couple of years ago. So our own kids, they started at age four or five, somewhere around there. 
I started when I was nine. My nephew, who's really great on the fiddle, started when he was 15. So there's, there's no age limit. That said, like anything, if you start when you're young, it's way easier to learn, way quicker to learn, and you'll get better faster. Um, to be really great when you start at age 60, it's probably not likely um, that you're going to be really great, but you'll certainly be able to play for yourself, you know, and your friends, and, but you won't, you won't start a career out of it because it's, it's like anything, it's, it's very challenging to reach such a high level when, you know, there's others who have been at it for decades longer. Um, and getting at those, those young years are great for everything. You know, if you can get kids started when they're young. Um, and so how did that relate? You kind of asked two things. What was the actual question you asked? I think it was just, just, um, about, um, aimed at there's no, there's no age what can start the violin because I've seen two or three year olds play the violin um, but basically, they would use what is like the uh, the colored violins when they start. Uh, did you yeah. start off with a colored violin? Are they any good? Um, they're, they they can be good for a certain purpose. I mean, there is they are absolutely not a replacement for a, an acoustic, a beautiful handmade instrument. Um, but that might not someone who has a colored violin won't be looking for that. They'll be looking for fun, novelty, um, maybe a different, uh, unique kind of a tone. That doesn't sound like a violin, but sounds more like um, just some kind of electronic, you know, sound. And that has its place, too. That's that's interesting. What, what do you think of... Um, so you were dancing and playing the violin. What do you think of... I don't... Are you familiar with Amadeus or Bond? Consisting no. of like two or three girls? Okay, so there are three girls. They all play electric violin, and one of them plays the cello. Is it true that if you know how to play the violin, you can play the cello as well? Well, I wouldn't quite go that far, but there's a lot of similarities, so it's very helpful. We had a cello here. Somebody had dropped it off a couple years ago, and so we had it for like a week. And so I sat down, and everything is backwards, right? But, you know, I know how to put fingers on on stringed instruments. I, I know how to move a bow, like... So it's it's kind of up upside down and backwards, but the, the techniques are very similar, and it's just a matter of relearning um, the the uh, fingering for your tunes and relearning how to adjust everything you know on the bow at a different angle. So yeah, it will help a lot. Yeah, do you have to literally take violin be taught? from a violin virtuoso how to play the violin or, or can you just pick up the violin and learn on your own like YouTube channel or how do you feel about that? Whatever gets you there, whatever gets you there, different strokes, you know, for different people. Um, there's a great, great value to the internet with regards to that sort of thing. Yeah. Lots of people can, can learn a pile of stuff. I mean, my own kids show that how, they want to learn my, my son who plays guitar, you know, wants to learn a guitar tune. And he just goes on YouTube and clicks in stairway to heaven and presto, someone's teaching it to you. So that's fine. You can learn like that. Um, I think it, it depends on what you want to become. And I suppose people don't necessarily know what they become, What people don't necessarily know what they want to become until they know enough to know what they can become. Like um, you might start something and, and think, oh, I'm just doing this for fun. But then you realize you're kind of good or you really, really like it or you've exhausted all there is to know on the Internet and you need some you need a person to help you. And or other people might come to it with big aspirations, thinking I want to be a star, you know, and then they start and they realize I don't got what it takes to persevere. This is too hard for me or I'm not as interested. I just want the fame. I don't want the shame. I don't want the pain. All the fame and none of the pain. That's not going to work. <laughs> you have to put the yeah. pain in to get the fame. <laughs> <laughs> How many um, violinists have you played against or with at one time besides you and Donnell? Probably 100. Really? Uh -huh. Oh, I'd love to have seen that. And were yeah. they all supposed to be playing a different, uh, like, that's, I can imagine watching all these violinists just play at one time. That must have been amazing. Yep. It's the Cape Breton Fiddlers Association. 
That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Can you, that's that's yeah. Can you tell us about the um, the album you have out called Canvas uh, with you and Donnell? It's out March seventeenth. Can you tell us more about that one? Sure. Canvas will be very exciting. I'm. Uh, we spent two years recording it. It was during the all the COVID lockdowns. We bought studio equipment and we did a record. And it's ninety wow. percent uh, original material, and it's finished. It's going to be out in less than a week. We're thrilled. Um, Yo Yo Ma is on there. We were talking about him a little bit, and um, uh, Rhiannon Giddens, a wonderful singer in the folk world, uh, who sang a Gaelic song, uh, which is I think if you I think it's on iTunes now as a release. They released a couple of tunes, pre-released them. Uh, Color Theory is another tune you can get on iTunes. And um, we have a Spanish guitarist uh, that we got for a number, on a couple of numbers, actually. A great flutist, flutist as well from Ireland, Brian Finnegan. And uh, it's all Danelle and I, you know, duets and some solo stuff. Um, but with our band and some guests, as I mentioned, our daughter, Mary Frances, who's 17, plays a ton of piano on it. Um, our kids have some vocals on it in one number. It's, it's exciting. I'm so happy about it. Yeah. It was produced yeah, by Elmer wait. Ferrer. Thanks. Mm -hmm. It was produced by Elmer Ferrer, who is here right now, as we speak, um, starting up another production for my daughter. He's going to produce her record as well multi-talented family but we're looking forward to that one so that can you tell us about um why do you suppose that some violins are expensive like the stradivarius or is it because of the wood is it because it's laced with gold what would be your feelings on that yeah i don't know and uh i'm not I'm, I can tell you about me and my love for fiddle, but I can't tell you about fiddles. I, I really don't know anything about um, how they're made or what makes, what makes, what determines price. Um, I mean, obviously quality will have a lot to do with it, but I don't, I, I don't know what makes that quality. I'm sure it's got to do with common sense things, the wood, the craftsmanship, details, all those things. It's very fascinating territory. Um, when we take our fiddles into Remini House of Music in Toronto, um, he, Michael Remini always has a fascinating story to share, his wealth of violins and your very question he would do an incredible job of answering. You should interview him sometime. Yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. And when you want to play the violin, why did – why – do you play with the right hand? Why can't you just put the bow? Like for me, I'd be putting the bow on my left hand and putting the, the violin on my right shoulder. Why can't you put the violin rested on your left shoulder and play with your right hand? Like be ambidextrous violin. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. I, I don't know. I don't know why it's somebody just decided this is the way the fiddle is going. Um, I do know within the fiddle itself, whoever chose to put the high string on the right side and the low string on the left, high on the right, low on the left. I know that inside the instrument, there's a bass bar. So the bass bar is on a certain side. It's on, the, I think it's on the side of the bass, the bass strings. And so the fiddle is designed so that the best tone for the higher strings is on the right side and the best tone for the lower sounds is in the left. And when you're playing, the easiest, most efficient way to attack those notes is to, again, have your bow hand on your right hand. And so that, yeah, you just go over like that. So when you see um, someone who is a left-handed fiddler playing um, a typical traditionally built violin, it looks really odd or awkward you know because they've switched hands but they have not switched the strings on the instrument because you kind of can't again that bass bar is where it is and it's meant to enhance the bass end of the fiddle where the strings are so 
There are some violins that are made for left-handed players where they switch it up so that it sounds as good as it can for someone playing left-handed. And, um, but my brother, Kevin was a left-handed fiddler and he played my fiddle. So he just dealt with the awkwardness of that. Rashad McIsaac is another one. He just picked up any fiddle, you know, like they're all, like he didn't get a special left-handed one made. He just had a regular one and he plays like that. Not sure why those things, again, I'm not good at those answers. I'm only, I'm only an expert on me. <laughs> So I take it you can play any violin then? I can play any violin, yeah. So what do you think of those violinists that actually play it like this and go ting, ting, this? They don't use the bow, they just hold it like a cello and they just play different notes with it. What do you think of those people? I think, I think everybody's got a purpose and go for whatever your purpose is. But speaking of the instrument, it's designed a certain way and... That's, that's where I'm at. I, I want to maximize the beauty of all that is there. So I, I just do it traditionally. What was the first song that you tried to play? Was it Mary Had a Little Lamb? When you first started playing the violin? It was actually Twinkle Little Star. Mm -hmm. And which, how did you follow up with that? Did you go just from easy to to made easy to difficult when did you start playing the difficult celtic pieces well it depends on who you ask what's difficult i remember playing a stress bay called the king george that was supposed to be difficult but i didn't find it that difficult i think the most difficult piece i learned earlier on or my first difficult piece was a tune called tulicorm and that was a very difficult tune and i spent a good number of weeks trying to perfect it but it's like anything you just just get lots of repertoire, play, play, play. And it's not necessarily so how, how much, so it's not necessarily about how difficult the piece is. You can even take great tunes like Twinkle Little Star and keep playing them for years really to develop all sorts of different skills. You know, your, your bowing, all your different bowing techniques, all your grace notes, everything can be learned on a very simple tune. And as that tune progresses, you make it more and more interesting and musical and yeah so pieces yeah but i will say that the tulicorum is was my first difficult piece i was probably 12 or so so I, I take it when you literally um start playing is it sort of like a practice playing you have to keep it and make sure it's in tune and then you do a little bit of tweaking do the note and then tweak it again before it sounds good is that what you do you just know okay Take my violin, start playing it. How do you prepare? You mean now? Like, how would you prepare for a performance? Do you do the tweaking? Just warm, the up. Just warm yeah. up. Sit backstage and play. Play and play and play. Play for an hour. Get your fingers and everything warmed up. Then go on and nail it. <laughs> nail it, yes. And you also have backup violins just in case something happens like the, the violin hair like the bow hair for instance might just or you break a string oh. for instance you have a back of violin yeah, always, always bring spare strings spare bow yeah yeah that's a good thing um yeah so i noticed that you're playing at the burlington sound and music festival i missed that one in 2018 that was like two years before the pandemic how did the pandemic affect you and your family what did you do to you know, you couldn't perform anymore. Did you do any um, Zoom concerts or did you just play your violin safe in your own home? How did you manage during the pandemic? Well, there was manage like personally and then manage um, professionally. Professionally, like I said, we bought this studio equipment and we did a record. Um, that was an awesome choice. Um, and then also, too, we put on a couple of, uh, you know, um, shows uh what do you call them yeah virtual concerts they were very successful i think we had i think they did the numbers or they had seventy thousand views or something of this one show that we had through um almost maybe 60 theaters throughout north america picked it up that was very successful and 
then with regards to our family and personal life, you know, we practiced a lot. Um, Janelle and I, we never pat our backs for anything in life, but we patted our backs about how we handled that pandemic for the sake of our kids. And yeah. they, they got through it really well. They barely noticed a pandemic. In fact, when I asked them, how did you like the pandemic? <laughs> They're like, Mom, it was great. It was such a, such, such a great time. You know, we did so many great things. And I mean, even they know, even though they, they certainly are aware of the devastation in the world, but yeah. when you're five years old, you don't need to dwell on the devastation. You just need to be fed, clothed, warm, love, music, activities, you know, and, and so that's, that's what we gave them. And we had some great times in this house during that time period, trying to um, shelter them from burdens that are not necessary at young ages. What if the tech, what if a uh, pandemic happened 10 or 20 years ago? Would you have been able to handle it then? And I'm what's different because... about my life 10 years ago than it is now? What's different? I'm trying to think. No, I mean, because now that during the pandemic, even with me, you had the iPads, you had the iPhones, you had Wi-Fi, you could do, make a YouTube channel like I did. Um, and just... So more basic. More based on technology is your question. Like how would I you guess like 20 years ago, there was no iPhone or computers. Maybe you had one of those oh, one with the um, small computers, I guess. But then you had each other. You had your family. So probably nothing would have changed because you would just had each other. Well, I mean, the whole Internet thing is a, is a big debate. I'm, I'm always a believer that we'd be better off without it. Um, I know I've had just lighthearted discussions with friends and they're like, no way. What about this? All this. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. But you know, and everybody's, everybody's entitled to an opinion on that. So for me, I, I would have preferred to have gone through it without technology. Um, you know, I mean, I'm grateful that we had those virtual concerts such as our times. So those are signs of our times. And we do live in this time. We, we, Danielle and I don't hide under a rock and abandon our, you know, the life around us, we, we embrace it and dive in. But that being said, I would be much happier to happier to have to go through life without any technology. Wow. Um, Living yeah. off the grid. Yeah. I, I see, I see great value in that. And of course I see the downfalls too. And like I said, it's a, if you can have a healthy discussion, it's a very interesting topic, but um so what would I have done 20 years ago? I would have just done the same things. We did a lot of just traipsing around on our farm here and getting more involved with the livestock and the horses. We did a lot of horseback riding and we have chickens and animals and we um, played a lot of card games, a lot of card games. And nice. we played a lot of music. Our kids took on some extra classes for for music and if the internet wasn't there i'd teach them something myself like we, we would just basically do what we did and living on a the, farm you have all these like hens and chickens and cows you're like living my friend who's a staunch vegan vegan uh, he wants he wants to live on a farm and have all these animals like lambs and sheep and chickens to protect them because he doesn't believe in that we should eat meat what are your thoughts on veganism well, well, let's dive in. <clears throat> well, do you know? Do you know who you're asking? We're, we we raise beef cattle. Isn't that funny? We raise beef yeah. cattle. So I I'm not a vegan. To each his own. I mean, uh, everybody comes to things for different reasons. Um, and I I'm a believer based on the the information that I have in my life that meat's good for you and we're we have domain over the animals and my ancestors grew up on it and and so um um i'm not i wouldn't say i'm old school thinking and i'm just uh i'm aware enough of things i try and keep my hand on the pulse of um of just debates of different sorts so i can have an opinion about it uh i certainly am not um really educated or knowledgeable it's very surface um my awareness of meat and the value of it um 
and I don't, I know very little about vegan. Um, I have friends who are vegan and, um, but I don't, I don't know, we don't get into it, into talking about it on a deep level. I just kind of see you do what you like and I'm doing what I like and let's live together in this world in harmony and focus on our similarities, not our differences. That's, that's uh, excellent. That's how you change the world. Like Greta Thunberg tried to change. Well, she didn't want to change the world. She just wanted to talk about climate change. And I don't know how successful she was because she refuses to fly in a plane and she travels by boat to make sure that the uh, actual uh, stratosphere or the world is not, you know. <laughs> so she, she, what do you think of what she did at that age, 16 years old, trying to I'll save the world? She's got some pile of guts. I wish there were other people who had things they believed in would go out and and speak it. Um, you know, that's very admirable. That being said, you know, there's debate in everything. There's debate in everything. And debate is good. Debate is what we need. And, you know, there's people on the complete other end of the spectrum that have their own views and have uh, without a shred of doubt, you know, that that's just nonsense. Mm -hmm. So it's like, who do you believe? I mean, everybody has a responsibility to, if you have a curiosity, about, a curiosity about something, you really have to go dive in. And when people fight for something, whether you agree with them or not, um, I would hope and I believe that it comes from a good place when you fight for something that you believe in. And that is um, virtuous to, to feel a calling to try and share what you believe is true with people. Um, and then hopefully through those sources of information, each one of us as human beings sharing this earth can dive into it with their intellect and decide, you know what, I've been asked to consider something um, and I'm going to do that. And do I, do I agree with this or do I disagree with this? Um, you know, people are fallible and, and we, we all make mistakes and we all have a journey. We can all grow as well. So what I thought 10 years ago about certain things isn't what I think now. Um, and was I right then? Am I right now? I think when we all leave this world, we'll maybe have a better sense of that. Um, but I think most of most people are attracted to truth and we're on a journey here to find it. Um, so speak your truth and hopefully, hopefully this world can find a, a balance through all of that. Everyone, this is Nellie McMaster, Canadian violinist and is a new album coming out called Canvas available March 17 streaming on all platforms. Peace. <laughs> Thank you. Peace to you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.